Well, I have to say, sometimes very big questions require a very big panel. <laughs> and today we are so blessed to have this group of people who span across government, public policy, philanthropy, and technology to share with us a little bit of insight, whatever we can pack into one hour, on digital education for emerging markets, especially for the edge case of the most vulnerable communities uh, and those that really need the interventions to see a step change in educational attainment around the world. We had an incredible workshop earlier this morning with many of these speakers and several others. We heard from groups like the Norwegian Refugee Council who were working with Microsoft on chatbots to advance learning and access to higher education. We heard from War Child. Uh, they're creating games using AI and all sorts of engaging design to get kids learning. So this session really builds on that workshop, uh, and we have the pleasure, of course, of a sitting government official, the Vice Minister for Education from Equatorial Guinea. We're going to hear some of her opening remarks uh, in a more formal sense, perspectives on the question of the day. Su Excelencia, muchas gracias por estar aquí con nosotros. Te dejamos espacio para compartir sus perspectivas. Buenas tardes, distinguida audiencia. Como he sido presentada por la moderadora, antes de proseguir con nuestro panel, le voy a resumir brevemente de dónde procedo, por si hay alguien que no conoce lo que es mi país. <risa> la República de Guinea Ecuatorial es un país pequeño, situado en el corazón de África Central, y el único país que habla español en África. Porque, bueno, la palabra no encaja muy bien, pero se tiene que decir. Hemos sido colonizados durante 200 años por España. Por eso todo lo que tenemos más que nada de cultura es cultura española, independientemente de las culturas propias del país. La lengua oficial, la primera lengua oficial de Guinea Ecuatorial y la que predomina hasta esta parte en la administración es el español. Las otras lenguas, como el francés, el portugués, eh, se han introducido últimamente. Guinea Ecuatorial tiene menos de dos millones y medio de habitantes y está dividida a gran escala en dos regiones, la región insular y la región continental. Cinco son los grupos étnicos principales que integran el país. El Bubi, el Fang, el Doe, el Vicio, o Mabea y el Jambo, conocidos normalmente como anoboneses. También está eh, por integra integrarse eh, los Bayeles, que se conocen normalmente como pigmeos. Hablando del sistema educa educativo, que es el objeto de nuestro encuentro aquí, la educación, nuestro sistema educativo está en periodo de transformación, dado que la vertiginosa evolución del mundo supone una exigencia para las sociedades. Nadie puede estar hoy día estático, porque el mundo tampoco es estático, sino dinámico. En el sector educativo, nuestros objetivos giran fundamentalmente en ampli ampliar el acceso y mejorar la calidad, de esto estamos luchando, como muchos países, creo yo. En nuestro programa, que tenemos un programa mayor de educación para todos, hacia el horizonte 2020, pretendemos como objetivos, entre otros, alcanzar una cobertura universal en la educación preescolar y primaria y una tasa de matrícula bruta de al menos 98% en la educación secundaria. Mejorar la calidad de la educación asegurando una preparación adecuada de los docentes. Eliminar la disparidad de género y adaptar la educación profesional, técnica y superior en las necesidades del mercado laboral. Desde esa línea de propósitos, destacar y reconocer aquí que la sociedad contemporánea avanza vertiginosamente en su desarrollo por el empleo a gran escala de la tecnología de la información y la comunicación, cuyos productos audiovisuales interactivos 
penetran cada vez las culturas y condicionan nuestras formas de hacer, pensar, convivir y ser, configurando en su alcance una aldea global y una sociedad del conocimiento. Hablar sobre la digitalización de, en educación es referirse a la ayuda que sitúa al alumno en el centro del sector educativo. Sin embargo, no todos los ciudadanos en el mundo pueden acceder a sus bondades, quedando atrapados en el analfabetismo digital, una gran barrera que limita su participación social, formativa y laboral, dado que todavía hay muchos países y millones y millones de personas en muchos países, valga la redundancia, que integran el globo terráqueo que no gozan plena, ni plena ni medianamente de los elementos que permiten el acceso a las TIC, como la luz, y si hay luz, no hay internet, ordenadores, etc. Reconocemos y le damos gran importancia que merece el tener al alcance de la mano en los centros educativos las facilidades que nos acceden a la digitalización de la educación. Y nuestra preocupación y misión fundamental debe ser la de buscar y promover la obtención y aplicación de nuevos paradigmas en la enseñanza y en el aprendizaje, es decir, en el proceso enseñanza-aprendizaje, con roles que, a pesar de estar esbozados, sufren de retardo y oposición en su ejercicio por constituirse factores de cambio y respeto a las prácticas docentes tradicionales. El sector educativo es decisivo para la formación y el desarrollo del capital humano en cada nación, ya que permite trabajar en la innovación, en la creatividad, para lograr un crecimiento sostenible. La importancia del manejo de las tecnologías de la información y comunicación en el contexto actual es crucial para el desarrollo económico del país. Implantar la educación o introducir la educación digital en el sector educativo tiene muchísimas ventajas. Entre ellas, solo citaré algunas. Centralizar la información académica y administrativa. Muchas veces la información en las instituciones educativas se encuentra en papel y dispersa en diferentes, en diversos sistemas, por lo que se requiere invertir mucho tiempo en recabar y analizar la información para tomar decisiones. Mejorar la comunicación. Las nuevas tecnologías mejoran la recopilación de datos en los sistemas educativos y publican información relevante mediante sitios web, seguros para mantener información a los padres sobre la educación que reciben sus hijos, publicar comunicados, desempeño académico, tareas y mantener una comunicación con los profesores. La comunicación entre profesor y alumno, alumno y alumno para el trabajo en equipo y permiten la creación de foros de discusión sobre diversos temas. Otras ventajas. Nuevas formas de enseñar y de evaluar, aunque muchos profesores invierten tiempo evitando que los alumnos se copien entre sí durante un examen en línea. En general, esas herramientas ofrecen la posibilidad de fomentar nuevas maneras de enseñar a distancia. Tecnologías móviles. La evolución de las tecnologías móviles y la proliferación de dispositivos teléfonos simples, teléfonos inteligentes, tabletas, computadoras portátiles, en la última década han transformado la vida para muchas personas. En mi país, pese a algunas dificultades de acceso, conectamos en Internet, sobre todo en las dos ciudades más importantes, de Bata y Malabo, también en algunas otras ciudades eh, que les siguen la importancia. No obstante, existe, tenemos una preocupación. No vaya a ser que de aquí a dos, a dos tres, cuatro, cinco años en la familia no pueda comunicarse, porque todo el mundo está conectado en Internet o está hablando por móvil. Por lo menos esto en mi país está siendo un poco de preocupación. Para concluir, distinguida y respetada audiencia, señoras y señores, 
La digitalización es una maravilla a la que hay que sacar provecho. Las nuevas tecnologías son una gran ayuda valiosa, pero en el caso de la educación muchas veces representan un complemento, sobre todo en los países en desarrollo o llámense emergentes. Muchas gracias por su atención. There are so many reasons why I'm grateful we could start with that public address. First and foremost, Her Excellency is also a former teacher and has worked very hard on social inclusion and gender inclusion in her country. So all of these questions of human capital and what it means to educate those who don't have access to such tools and pathways are things that she's worked on. But also because there's no talking about digital education in emerging markets without understanding the perspective of governments and how they see the opportunities. So with that, I'd like to shift over to Val Mendes from UNESCO. Val, you are working on policy and implementation of ICT for education with all of the member countries of the United Nations. So in the emerging market sphere, what are the big challenges and how is it going? What adoption are we really starting to see? Thank you. Thank you very much. Can, can Maybe you a little bit louder on them. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation, first of all. Uh, definitely, in emerging markets, we still need to talk in terms of improving the quality of education, and not just in terms of emerging markets in all countries. As you can see, if any international report, if we take a look in the numbers of people that right now are achieving the minimum in terms of literacy and uh, other uh, reading or other basic competences are very low. So I would start, and actually I repeat myself in terms of the panel of this morning, but I think the main message here is that we cannot have emerging markets in business without a very serious and sound education system. And I mean education system, not just the formal education, but all non-formal and informal uh, areas as well. So I would start with a, a number that I think is, is strikes me and I think is important to remember. The number of people that right now, young people and children, that are not achieving this basic literacy and numeracy. So we are talking about six, more than 600 million people. We are talking about 60% of the global child, children and young people are not learning the basics. Therefore, if we don't address this basic education with innovative solutions, we cannot uh, talk about technology, we cannot talk about the other challenge that we have. I can carry on, but... Uh, we'll, we'll get back to it. As perfect. we heard from the Vice Minister, electrification, even exactly. access to the internet. We're talking about very vulnerable environments. Yep. This morning we heard from Priscilla Cruz from Todos Pela Educación, Educação, excuse me, in Brazil. Um, and she was working in environments where only 41% of Brazilian kids uh, are not completing high school. So, so a whole lot of need in terms of vulnerability. Former President Arteaga, you led Ecuador for years, and it was your responsibility to raise up rural communities, make sure they were included. What role do you see digital education playing in that process? Well, thank you. Um, when I started this, I was tempted to follow the example of the Minister of yes. Guinea Equatorial and speak in my own language but uh, I have to follow instructions of the moderator. <laughs> I was trying to convince her today, but she says, no, please speak in English. Okay, I will try to. Um, I used to be a very young teacher. I started my life being a teacher at 17 years old. I used to be a very young politician, a journalist, a writer, and now I feel, and I found myself like a granny, a grandma. I have seven grandkids, and I'm writing poetry, and I'm writing books for kids. And I want to mention one of them. The name of the book is Princess Martina and the Chief of Languages. Imagine that um, I feel that that book is like science fiction, but when we hear what, how is the development of the science 
probably the next years, not next generation, but next years, we can found that we can go to libraries and change our chip and have the language that we need for the moment, for the travel and for doing other kind of things. With this in introduction, I want to answer the question about how a country like Ecuador, an emerging country in Latin America, in the other side of Guinea Equatorial, because we are also an Ecuadorial country, uh, how we manage uh, the um, issues about uh, digital education, how we can work uh, with kids that sometimes doesn't have enough to, 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 to have food, and um, uh, I know that the efforts of the government uh, since a long time ago was to um, eradicate illiteracy and um, how to put everybody to learn how to speak and to read and to, and to, and to write. But, um, and we get a lot of achievements. Almost 99% of the people of Ecuador uh, are in, in terms of literacy. But um, how we can involve them in digital education, and it's a, a big issue. Uh, I feel that uh, since uh, 2000 to now, um, the need of communication between the people that stayed in Ecuador and a lot of migrants um, moves forward people to get into digital education because they need to communicate, they need cell phones, they need to, to have Skype uh, talks with the people that are um, um, all over the world, especially United States, uh, Spain, uh, Italy. Then we need to communicate, and that's uh, like a window of opportunity. Uh, of course, uh, many NGOs, and the government, and the uh, local governments also are working also in how to uh, provide uh, tools like uh, laptops, uh, notebooks, like uh, phones. But in, um, in terms of uh, how we envision the future, we are thinking that one of the, the issues that we have to work the most is uh, training teachers. Uh, in recent weeks, in recent weeks, I attend a meeting of a group uh, called Atlantis, 25 ministers, former ministers of education all over the world, and we talk about the need to teach the teachers. Because if you don't have teachers that they have patience, that they are uh, knowledgeable about uh, what's happening in the world, you cannot, don't do anything. You can have the best uh, buildings, the best tools, but we, if we don't have trained teachers, we are don't, don't going to uh, get the goals and the achievements that we need, then um, we are now trying to work a lot with teachers, myself in my own NGO, we are working a lot with tra training teachers, not only about how to develop the new tools, because finally they are tools, but we want to have good citizens people that are uh, into ethics, that they uh, have open minds for the change that uh, we have nowadays. I remember that uh, when we see how is the growing of the knowledge around the world, uh, uh, the, uh, Mr. Gordon Moore says that uh, at least uh, from two years to two years, we, are, we have double knowledge that in the past then it is necessary to open the minds because probably we cannot know everything that happens, but for sure we need to have our open minds and the teachers are the best windows. Then, uh, like uh, the end that I want to say in this round is that um, digital uh, and uh, the tools that the science give to us are the windows for the universe for young kids. Thank you. Thank Very you. comprehensive view on the opportunities and some of the stumbling blocks. Andrew Cunningham, you're an education advisor to the Aga Khan Foundation. You're also an academic doing your doctoral work on many of these related issues. And in the report that you just released with UNICEF, looking at the deployment of ICT, especially in emerging markets, what were some of the other stumbling blocks? We had teacher training comes up often. What else? 
Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for inviting us. Um, and I'm no longer doing my doctoral work. Oh, it is great. finished, Fantastic. finally, after seven years. So we're very excited about that. But uh, I think just first, it's important to understand the Aga Khan Foundation and the Aga Khan Development Network as a unique player in this space around ed tech. We're not necessarily the partner of choice of the digitally savvy citizens on the front lines. We are, we are the partner of choice because we are out there in the most remote villages, in the most marginalized communities, with 80,000 of our own employees, 98% of whom actually live and work in the communities in northern Afghanistan, Pakistan, East Africa, throughout India. And we have those responsibilities to translate the local realities into globally informed policy influencing, influential mm -hmm. uh, statements and decisions. So when UNICEF came to us, they said, we really need to know what to do in terms of leveraging IT for raising learning outcomes. Many times the conversation has only been about the hardware issue. It's in fact about an equity issue. The digital divide is, 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 is extreme in itself with over 42% of the world still being disconnected 78% of the population in Africa still cannot get online. But even those who can get online, there's a second digital divide, the lack of competencies and skills to leverage that hardware in an effective way. So with UNICEF and the 17 countries within the sub-Saharan African regions, we asked the question, how do we use IT for improving learning? And how do we use information technology and communications to actually have a more inclusive approach to education. And the report is coming out next week. This is the first time it's even being mentioned, so you almost have a sneak peek. And it really draws out 10 reflective questions that organizations like UNICEF, like the Aga Khan Foundation, like the governments, should ask themselves first before deciding to take a particular innovation or particular contractor and put it to scale. And those reflections are, are about questions of teacher agency, student agency, student ownership, teacher ownership. But what's really important, I think, are, are two of the final recommendations. And one is about coalition building. The sector for ed tech particularly in the developing countries, is, is, an, is a wild, wild west. Who do you pay attention to? Why do you pay attention to them? There is a lack of evidence actually connecting the interventions with raised learning outcomes or the interventions with increased pedagogical competencies. That is a danger for decision making when you don't have an independence of evidence. Through coalition building mm -hmm. with researchers, with the ed tech firms, with government, with civil society, is the only way you can make an informed and collective decision that mitigates those risks. The second recommendation is to understand also the unfortunate dark side of technology. And particularly around, I mentioned three C's this morning. And I want to emphasize those three C's stand for content. Exposing children to content without any type of mentorship or any type of stewardship of what they're actually watching, reading, or seeing for the very first time. Second is conduct. How are they using technology, perhaps in dangerous ways, perhaps also engaging in anonymous bullying? We are having an, a generation of teachers that have no idea what's going on on WhatsApp, Snapchat, insert here all the rest. And then third is this question of contact. Who are these children and the teachers being put in contact with? Are they being put in contact with those that can actually give them different types of skills, knowledge, attitudes, and values? Or in fact, are they being put in contact with those who unfortunately have alternative, um, uh, alternative desires? Um, that frankly put children in a more vulnerable situation. So in summary, His Highness the Aga Khan, the global spiritual leader of the Shia Ismaili Muslim community around the world, 
said, I can describe modern learning in three A's. The spirit of anticipation, the spirit of adaptation, and the spirit of adventure. That's the promise of ed tech in the developing markets mm -hmm. and the emerging markets. And if we can partner with those like UNESCO and those government officials and the Pro Futuro Foundations and those other foundations in the space and take a coalition approach to leveraging ed tech for learning, we will actually move the needle in a responsible journey of adventure for education. And as you even highlighted in the report, the body of evidence for what works in emerging markets is still being written. We're in the very, very early days. And you have that great collaboration with Profuturo, the CEO, Sofia Fernandez, here with us. Can you tell us why digital education? Why was that intervention the one worth investing in? Well, I think that we all agree. I think we're... Um, yeah. Can you hear me now? Thank you. I think that there's no doubt after listening to all the panelists and the discussion we had this morning that the digital revolution that we're talking about is a revolution for development. And it means that it can, it is actually bridging many gaps. Now, we cannot be that confident if we do not do something about making sure that there's nobody falling behind. So to the historical divide that we've been facing, social, economic, um, the educational may face another one, which is the digital one. And, and that's the main reason why there's an urgency for digital education. Now, thinking positively about education, there are many good reasons apart from this. I mean, you can personalize education as we haven't done before. It used to be a luxury to have your own teacher. Now you can personalize, you can, you can um, evaluate continuously and immediately whether the student is learning or not, and that can be done through technology. But to me, and getting back to what you just said, the possibility of measuring the impact, mm -hmm. making sure that all this effort is effective, that is efficient, is something that we can do with the new technologies. I mean, artificial intelligence we were discussing today, or the big data, eventually are going to give us, actually, they're already giving us some clues in Pro Futuro about the level of usage, about the teachers who are uploading contents, creating their own contents. I mean, we are understanding what's going on, which used to be just uh, you know, a wishful thinking because you are right, many investments and you never know whether you are getting the right return. So, and, and I wouldn't forget another reason why digital education is very interesting. It's cost efficient. I mean, anything that can be scalable at the end of the day is affordable. So, I mean, it's, it's a good investment on communities and it's a need if we want them to be part of this digital economy. It's incredible. It's the first time in human history we can measure these things at all. And you see this in the deployment of ICT for development, these questions of how are we going to go out and measure nutrition, educational achievement. All of the SDGs end up being affected if we can measure and move these populations in a new direction. Mesa Jalboud from the Abdullah Al Guerrero Foundation, you are the CEO of that organization, but you've also studied across the Middle East education interventions for refugees. What have you learned about what works and what the opportunity is for digital education in the refugee context? So um, the Abdullah al Ghurair Foundation for Education works across the 22 Arab states and our focus is underserved, talented youth. A big part of that is the refugee community in the Arab world. So you might know that almost 50% of the refugee population uh, resides in the Arab world. So a big part of the reason that young people in our part of the world do not go to school or do not have access to regular schooling is because of conflict. So it's natural that much of what we are trying to achieve is to target that community. And naturally, we would look at digital education as a potential solution to reach refugees um, across the region, in particular um, Syrian refugees in, uh, more recently. And what we found is that while education technology has huge potential, and we're certainly investing in it, we're dabbling in several areas, we're not there yet. 
So I was listening very carefully here over the last couple of days to uh, what's happening around the world, what have we tested or not tested, what can we bring from other parts of the world. Um, and what I'm really, really hearing is that while we have developed a lot of interesting, fascinating um, technologies for education, we have not yet developed the kind of digital education that would really target the most disadvantaged young people. If you take a small country in the Arab world, Lebanon, where you have a massive refugee population, and you look at um, young people, the young refugees there, such as the 14-plus category, only 2% of those young people are actually receiving an education. So why is that when there's so much education technology available? There are so many challenges to accessing digital education, and it's not in the Middle East, there isn't really an issue of access to technology, although we can do a lot better on that. But let me give you some statistics. In 2005, mobile phone use in the Middle East was 26%. In 2015, that jumped to 108%. Internet penetration in 2005 was 8%. Today, it's more than 55%. That's actually higher than the global average. So it's not access to technology. What we're finding from the investments that we're making, including online learning, for example, um, you heard from um, Sanjay Sarma today from MIT, we were the first foundation in the world to invest in MicroMasters because we really wanted to believe in the potential of the MicroMasters for young people who aren't accessing education, and especially refugees. And what we found was that although a small number, a small cohort, succeeded and did so incredibly well, that refugees were not able in large numbers to succeed in that platform. So we have to do a lot better in Did that Did you get space. a sense for why it wasn't working for them? Yeah, um, we have several reasons. Um, much of the content that's available in digital education is in English. And when you come from an underserved background in the Arab world, much like many other parts of the world, you don't necessarily speak English fluently to the level where you can study online in that language fully. Another big reason, and I say this to all the uh, um, digital education providers who are here, young people in the emerging markets need support. The education systems, and especially public education, does not turn out independent learners. So we find when we add that small component of mentorship to study online, it makes a huge difference in their ability to complete and to succeed. Um, another reason is that the content isn't necessarily always relevant to what they need in the moment. So there's been much talk about, for example, creating online content for uh, schools, for high schools. Well, it's not really flying in the Middle East because we have regulatory bodies that still don't recognize online education. So we have to think about things much more creatively around blended learning, around working with authorities to convince them of the quality of the education we're providing. And we also have to consider the fact that in countries like the Arab world, almost 50% of the learners who are in school are not actually learning at the level that they need to be learning. So our le learning outcomes is a major issue. So when we think of digital education, we really do have to focus on learning outcomes. It can't be just about an access issue. So those are just a glimpse yep. of the kinds of things. Sophia, I've, I've heard you make this point very passionately before, that it's not just the education. It's the psychosocial support. It's the contextual. And finding the partners to provide that ecosystem yeah. where young people can really learn. Is there anything you want to add on that front? Yeah, uh, actually, we had that experience in, in Lebanon. It was very positive from an academic point of view. Um, but we got very useful feedback, and it goes in line with what you're saying. Education has a great potential, but itself is not enough. When you're talking about those, you know, contexts, they need psychosocial support. They need the classroom facilities. They need to enhance the level of the teachers, and all that comes together. And you have to look at it as a 
complete solution and not partially only the, the educational part of it. And that's why we, we're looking for partners and actually our partners now in, in, in Lebanon of the ERS and we are trying to build a model and I was discussing this with Marisa before and I hope that she's part of this definition because if it works, and hopefully will work, depends on who helps us to define it, it can be escalated afterwards and adjusted, of course, but uh, we need to think beyond education to make a difference. And there's that question of not just the localization of content and the translation of content, but we heard this morning from Maurice Conti and others the importance of contextual development of these very tools. Val, you think about that a lot as yeah, well. Definitely. Uh, actually, last year we had a big event in UNESCO that is called Mobile Learning Week. And the topic on that event was about refugees and what sort of technologies we can bring to that very hard context. And uh, we were happy to, to see some specific applications, for example, one developed by the, Nor the Norwegian agency with UNESCO. And uh, we could measure. So in that case, we have concrete results in terms of the efficacy of that app that was a game. And the results were incredible. It was, for example, in, for a specific group, we could increase 50% of the reading skills of that uh, group of students in a refugee camp in, in Syria. So. Uh, you can go online, you can look for, it's, it's a book, it's a publication, it's a collection of examples like this one. And uh, absolutely agree in terms of the context is very, very important. But also the technology is catching up. So in terms of language, we can see some new developments in terms of machine learning, in terms of automatic translation, and actually some other examples using videos where children can record with basic cellulars. Uh, they can record their own experience of learning and upload to these kind of applications. It's, it's still in the beginning, but I think we are starting breaking uh, these kind of barriers in terms of language and in terms of tailoring these contents to the specific population and in specific context. So I would invite, I will do a publicity uh, an announcement here. I will invite, invite all of you for next year, the first week of March. So please take note, first week of March 2019. UNESCO is inviting you all to join us a discussion on this topic, on education and ICT and education, and also in AI, in artificial intelligence. And we have the pleasure to count on uh, with uh, Profuturo that is supporting UNESCO's work uh, specifically on this topic. So please join us in the discussion and let's build together this kind of platforms to support learning. We are not talking about technology per se. Technology is just a tool. What we really want to change is the quality of learning. Because as the statistic is safe, and we can read a lot of numbers here, we are in a very serious situation. We need to improve the quality of learning. We are failing. And the main problems we have right now is actually the kids that are in school, the kids that are the children, young people that are in our regular education system are not achieving. The first are not achieving enough in terms of basic skills that we mentioned. And second, they are dropping out. They are leaving the system because they feel bored, they feel disengaged. And this is not just in developing countries. This is happening here as well. So we need to be creative with human intelligence, with artificial intelligence, bring this collective knowledge production as a human being we are able to do to try to find solutions to that. Some great points. Vulnerable communities aren't just on the other side of the world. They're Absolutely. also in our own cities and yeah. some of the underserved areas. Mesa, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I talked about the challenges, but I wanted to talk about one particular opportunity that we're finding to be very worthwhile to invest in and to encourage others to come into the space. And that is in the um, upskilling area. Much like what's happening in the US where we're seeing a lot of MOOCs um, being subscribed heavily by uh, the workforce or those who are trying to you know, upgrade their skills and, and, and get better jobs. It's the same thing in the emerging markets. With the quality of education uh, being poorer, 
we're finding that young people are interested in using digital education to um, improve their skills. And we've found that the uh, employment market is very receptive to that. So we still target the same kind of young people that we want to help, those that come from underserved communities. But the idea is to link the education journey online with experience and to make sure that the outcome that we're looking for there is proper employment. Um, so this is a huge opportunity, and we're very interested in collaborating with other organizations that work in that space. And what does that look like? An internship and a MOOC at the same time? What does that pair? It, it could be a young person who is an entrepreneur and you know, needs to learn some skills to uh, you know, widen their company services. It could be somebody who's currently working. Um, or it could be companies that are interested in investing in um, new skills that they can't find in the market. And so they target a particular group. We're doing that with refugees in Jordan right now, where we're targeting um, uh, refugees who are out of the job market and the education sector and giving them specific, vo specific vocational education that's linked to a company that would hire them immediately after they graduate from the program. And it could be formal or informal credentials as long as it leads to employment. So there's been a, a very, very high frequency use of the term lifelong learning on this stage for the past several days. But for these refugees, that's sometimes all they have starting at age 12 or 13. We heard from the Sonbola Initiative from Syria, Massa, somewhere in the audience here. Um, they're using STEM for refugees in countries where these, these young kids don't even have the right to work. So they really have to be practical about giving them skills that are transportable and useful for their self-reliance. Andrew, I see you nodding. What, what are your thoughts on this, and especially non-formal education provisions? Yeah, no, thanks. Um... You know, I'm just, so I spent basically three and a half years of my life living in a mud hut in Kenya. That was my entrance into education. Um, starting a girls' secondary boarding school, no electricity, no running water. Um, and I'm just, I was struck, however, by the outstanding supply and demand chain of the Coca-Cola company. There was a wonderful cooler that had ice that was brought in from the 60 kilometers. And man, they had efficiency. They would refill the Fantas, or refill the Sprites, or refill the Coca-Colas. But then you go to the schools, and there was no responsiveness to the lack of supplies. There was no responsiveness to teacher absenteeism. There was no connection to the centralized governance of the supply and demand. And so I just wanted to highlight that because that struck me as a question when we're thinking about the promise of technology and education technology in emerging markets. We as the foundation, sort of eight years later after this moment of, uh, you know, not ever being thirsty of Coca-Cola, but being, you know, hungry for a little bit of change in the education system, we partnered with Salesforce because Coca-Cola uses Salesforce. Most of the Fortune 500 companies use Salesforce for responsive data management, customer relationship management software. The question is, why would the education sector perhaps not use the best in class education technology out there? And so we've worked with them as the Aga Khan Foundation over the last year to take their product and make it into an offline app. So an offline first, mobile friendly approach to a global good that has been in the developing markets, but not in perhaps the education markets. So I think the lesson from this is not, not becoming comfortable with the technology that's good enough. Because I think it's more of an adventure and more of also responsibility in terms of ethics is to take the best in class offerings in technology and make them work in the context, rather than use the limitation of the context and have perhaps the second, third, fourth best technology offering. Madam President. Yeah, uh, I want to, to talk about some issues. One is uh, 
In countries like in some of the Latin American countries, we have a kind of bilingual education, trying to preserve the original languages of the people. Then it's not only an issue of Spanish and English. Most of the population doesn't speak English, and that's a lack of, uh, or it's a problem when you want to have access to mentoring and to other kind of uh, possibilities. Uh, then we are trying to deal with all these kind of situations. Uh, um, in Ecuador, that is uh, one of the smaller countries of uh, Latin America, we have more than 13 languages uh, that we want to maintain and to protect because it means identity for the people, uh, it means uh, self-esteem. The other issue that sometimes we forget to mention that in Latin America, we have a big humanitarian crisis because we are talking about refugees in many countries and it's a really terrible situation. But in Latin America, we are living a humanitarian crisis with the refugees from Venezuela because of economic and political situation. In Ecuador, being a small country, we have more than 300,000 Venezuelans that go uh, crossing all the way from Venezuela to Colombia and then to Ecuador, and some of them goes to the other countries, then what's happening with the kids? What's happening with the education of the young population of Venezuelans uh, that are going through our countries and staying in our countries? Some countries like Ecuador are, are making a big effort to Absolutely. give them the possibilities of good life and good education. There's but a it's huge opportunity, a That's huge opportunity to educate those kids and to pull in some of the things that were learned from the Syrian crisis and the Middle East. Yeah, so a real of, of knowledge course. transfer opportunity. Before we run out of time, so we're already almost up on the hour, I want to get back to this point of teacher training, which comes up again and again. Yeah. Val, is there any guidance that you have been giving or hearing yeah, from, uh, from uh, member a states? A lot, a lot. Yeah. Uh, teaching training for me is uh, like a persistent effort. Yeah. Because if we don't get uh, self-esteem on teachers, if we don't get preparation for teachers, we are not going to yeah. achieve all the goals that we want. And, 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 and our, our, colleague, uh, yeah. our yeah. colleague Val, you, you, you look at this across 193 countries. Yeah. Anything that stands out for you? Yeah, definitely. It's, of course, one of the main areas of UNESCO because we believe the same. Without teachers and teachers training, we cannot change the system. So when we talk about technology, we try to work, we created a, a thing that is called a framework on how we can try to cap generate some capacity building in the teaching community in terms of ICT. So this is one area of action. Uh, actually, two days ago was the, the teacher's day, so a lot of programs are designed for them. And once again, we cannot use technology without teachers. So it's, it's absolutely necessary. And when we talk about these frontier technologies like uh, AI, we need to see it as, of course, a support to these teaching yeah. teachers that are there is struggling. And every day with a new um, assignment or with a new request from their governments, etc. Yeah. So definitely, teachers training is the, is the pillar of any education transformation. I want to hear once more from Vice Minister of, from Equatorial Guinea on this question. ¿Qué tenemos hacer por los maestros para ayudarles en usar los herramientas digitales? Gracias. Los maestros necesitan formación continua, formación permanente. Pero para lo que nos toca ya en la actualidad a nivel de la educación digital en las aulas es formarlos formación constante con, con un seguimiento uh -huh. porque aunque he declarado aquí que eh, el tema de luz tenemos un programa que está ya circulando efectivo es que luz para todos es decir, quiero aclarar aquí que cuando he dicho que hay lugares donde falta luz Guinea Ecuatoriana está incluido porque nuestro programa de luz para todos se, se está cumpliendo ahora también se registra mucho en, la, en las cabeceras de los distritos eh, alguno que otra, otro manejo del WhatsApp. Porque en Guinea Ecuatorial, repito, todos los distritos tienen luz. Tenemos un programa eh, de, en aplicación sobre 
la informatización de la administración. Quiere decir que cualquier proyecto, como el proyecto Pro Futuro, me permito el lujo de mencionarlo, en voz alta, que hemos acogido con, con dos manos, no tenemos cinco, no, nos hubiéramos, um, lo hubiéramos acogido con cinco manos, va a tener su sitio, va a tener su efectividad, porque nosotros, a nosotros nos parece que es viable. El tema de luz, cuando yo lo he aludido, repito, no me refería a Guinea Ecuatorial, sino a otros países. Uh -huh. Yo conozco muchos que no tienen, no tienen acceso, ya no digo internet, no tienen luz. Nosotros estamos esperando, aunque usted no me lo ha preguntado, estamos esperando eh, reavivar más en este curso académico la, la implementación del, del, del proyecto Pro Futuro. Sofía, any final thoughts as we wrap up here on content and the debate around content? How do we make the choice? How do we even think about the choice of content, what we're teaching and what we're trying to give these kids? Yeah, um, the way we envision the content provision um, is, 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 is including the, the troncal contents that we believe go along with the, the literacy which means linguistics, and actually we do provide in four languages. We are starting with Arabic, also in linguistics, um, STEM, of course, and then there's a very important thing that, that we consider that is needed in many, many places, and that has to do with the life skills, the attitudes, the, the values that we can um, uh, help them to, to share with us. Now, it's impossible from our point of view to tackle every specific context in every country where we go, and the way we tackle that is with alliances, local alliances, like we went to South Africa very recently, and we visited one of those schools, and there's a, uh, another startup they are providing with local contents for those schools. So we, I mean, our vision is to complement what we provide with the local contents. And that's the reason why our platform is, is open. And we believe that one size does not fit, fit all. I mean, you need to combine your effort with, with others. And if I may say something with regards to the teachers, there's something that we've learned uh, in our in, uh, implementation is needed, is motivation. Um, when we talk to some governments, um, many times has come across the fact that eventually certification of those teachers becoming technically savvy and helping them to progress within their own careers might be useful, but it's, it's about teaching them, continuous teaching and supporting them, and it's about motivation, which is something even more difficult many times because they have the resilience to keep things the way they are, not to move into a new you know, experiment. It's an incredible insight. And also, we were talking earlier, governments aren't used to software updates every six months. Training, this is a, a real mindset shift and a new practice area for them. Andrew, what do you wish we were seeing in the marketplace in terms of new products or designs? What's your advice to this crowd on what they should be developing? So building off of the content question, I think how we train teachers needs to be revolutionized. And there were two promising ideas um, that are sort of on my mind. And one is from an existing company called Talking Points. And they simultaneously translate WhatsApp messages, but it's on their own platform, to the teacher from the parents who don't have that language as their first language. That is a game changer for parental engagement. It is one of the simplest things, but it's something that as teachers, they don't have the opportunity to reach those parents of perhaps the immigrants or the refugees or the most excluded. So language, but simultaneous language. And then second is when you think about the profession of teaching, it's not about dumbing it down and saying that these are the 10 particular skills you need. In fact, it's exposing them to other teachers around the world that perhaps have identified something amazing that they're doing in the classroom. And Teach for All has leveraged the Facebook Live feature where you actually can collectively, with 300 or 400 teachers, watch a two to three minute clip of a teacher perhaps in India, perhaps in Houston, Texas, 
perhaps here in Madrid, and you're identifying the particular competencies almost like with the like button. So think about the data in terms of actually generating teacher competencies, but also just think how fun that is for when you're watching a teacher and you're also able to comment and ask questions, why, why is that that competency and why is that uh, perhaps something I want to know more about? Mesa, let's end with you. What do you wish you were seeing, your advice to this group? Actually, I'm really excited to share with you that one of my wishes in digital education is becoming true. Uh, later this month, we're going to be launching a digital platform that we've developed with Arizona State University, which is the number one innovative university in the United States. It's a college and career readiness platform. So when we talk about the kinds of skills that the marketplace needs and the kinds of experiences that young people need to have before they make the choice to continue to college or go into careers, we've developed a platform targeting young people with amazing educators like Barbara Oakley, um, where this is going to be available to all your Arab youth and hopefully also to the rest of the world. Two uh, just incredible development and two big insights that stand out for me. One from the vice minister we were speaking earlier. She said it's, it is access to technology that helps these kids realize what they don't have and helps create that motivation for them to go the next mile in their own development. And Sophia, what you're describing in terms of the way you form these partnerships of having that scale and really operating in many countries around the world in a way that's interoperable with partners for that contextual and localized effective solution. Very fascinating insights all around. Thank you, everyone. Please join me in a round of applause for all of our speakers. Thank you.